from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, our first show of the new year. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm Ty Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. As forecasts change for Brazil. We shifted to a wetter pattern in Brazil. That's all there is to it, and that's why the market's down. Soybean prices continue to sink to start 2024. Why one meteorologist says the weather change may not be good news for crops in Brazil. To be honest with you, I think this is a worst case scenario compared to if it just stayed drier. We're keeping an eye on some major winter storms and seeing if El Nino is to blame. I think this is just the beginning of a much bigger overall mid to late winter pattern here. It's a common problem on farms no matter where you live too many hats, but there's one collection that tops them all. So this is still the world's largest hat collection. Over 109,000, I would guess, about 115,000 if I had to take a guess. We're traveling the countryside to uncover the story behind the collector, not a hoarder of hats. U.S. Farm Report, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when blood, sweat, and tears meet rain, wind, and sun. Pioneer. What's next happens here. Now for the news. Falling farm income is a trend that could continue into the new year. USDA says 2023 saw a 21% drop in net cash farm income. Now producers are worried about falling crop and livestock prices heading into 2024. But USDA's chief meteorologist Seth Meyer says despite the potential of falling income, He's certain that the industry is prepared. I think you've had three really good years in the farm sector. Anxious years, but three good years, which gives me some confidence that producers will be able to manage a downturn because they're in a good position to do so. Meyer says marketing and margins are going to be important to watch in 2024. A recent survey of farmers shows many are stepping cautiously into 2024. That's according to the latest Ag Economy Barometer. The monthly survey of farmers by Purdue University and the CME Group shows a reading of 114 for December. That's down just a point from November, but 10 percent below a year ago in December of 2022. But the biggest change, farmers' inflation expectations in the coming year were significantly lower than they were at the start of 2023. High input costs remain a top concern, followed by lower crop and livestock prices. Well, one piece of the livestock industry feeling the pinch of tighter margins, the dairy industry. Waning margins caused by high costs and lower milk prices are forcing more dairy farmers to call it quits. A new report shows the struggles are hitting Minnesota's producers especially hard, with the state losing 58 dairy farms in November of 2023. According to our reporting partners at Dairy Herd, that big of a monthly drop has not happened since 2007. Now, in 2023, it's reported the state lost 146 dairy farms. That's based on the number of permits the state did at the beginning of the year compared to the end. Dairy Herd reports that record high beef prices and uncertain milk futures are a big culprit for the loss. Also, it's important to note that even though it's higher exit rates than normal to end the year, those herds aren't lost. They are absorbed by larger dairies. Ever Ag's Phil Plored calling it a rough year for dairy producers, with DMC calculations showing average margins for dairy farmers dropped last year to the lowest level since 2012. Missouri's governor took a step to ban China owning farmland in Missouri, but it's not a complete ban. Instead, it only applies to purchasing agricultural land within a 10 mile radius of critical military facilities. Governor Mike Parson announcing the executive order on Tuesday. It impacts more than just China. Effective immediately, the governor says the order bans individuals and businesses from nations that are designated as foreign adversaries from purchasing ag land surrounding critical military facilities across the state. The order also gives the Missouri Department of Agriculture greater authority and oversight over all foreign ag land purchases. Those will now go through the state's Department of Ag. It's also important to note that this order does not impact current land owners. This is as far as an executive authority goes under the current law of the state. Believe me, if I had the authority, we wouldn't just be talking about banning farmland but all commercial properties by foreign adversaries, regardless of rural or urban. 
Parson says Missouri didn't want to go the route of a complete ban on foreign-owned farmland as it would harm Missourians from state allies. That includes foreign investments that bring billions of dollars and thousands of jobs to the state. Critics say the executive order does not go far enough. Soybean prices were sinking to start the year. One reason is rain returning to key growing areas in South America. But one ag meteorologist thinks this rain could do more harm than good. Eric Snodgrass is an atmospheric scientist for Nutrient Ag Solutions. He says the sudden switch from the last three months where South America had been incredibly dry, especially in the West region, is now showing models that are making a pretty substantial flip over to much wetter condition with forecasts pointing to as much as 8 to 10 inches in a span of just two weeks. To be honest with you, I think this is a worst case scenario compared to if it just stayed drier. What I mean by that is you bring in all that rain, it's going to impact some early harvest. But what happens if all of that moisture begins to get recycled? In other words, it sticks around and it makes things wetter uh, for a while. Now, all of a sudden, you start pushing back the, 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 the harvest time period, and that's going to just keep pushing that crop calendar such that the safrina grows in late. That's it for the headlines. Well, if you've been in complaining of little to no snow this winter, that could soon change. We're keeping our eye on some monster winter storms. That's weather next. U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. The 3100 and 3200 series heavy duty manure spreaders are available in 235 to 430 bushel models and feature a standard two speed apron drive. Find out more at the H&S website. Time now for a check of weather. Matt Engelbrecht joining us with weather. Matt, the models are showing the potential for some really impressive snowfall amounts over the next couple of weeks with these winter storms. I know it's early, but we're talking about the possibility of several feet of snow in places. Yeah, time. It's been a while since I've been able to show you the seven day estimated rainfall or snowfall map and have it really fill out across the United States. So you want to talk about an active pattern? This is it. And we're just starting to see the first system move through and we have two more. Now, now the second one is going to be more of a Midwest a storm that could bring not only some rain, a good amount of rain, but also some snowfall. The third that's going to come through is more about the cold air that is behind it to some colder air dropping down from the north to the south. But here's like the estimated rainfall and snowfall in the next seven days over here towards the east. You see the higher uh, totals. That's all going to be rain over the next seven days, and then it's going to be kind of a half and half type situation going through the week. It's not that very cold January air where everything is snow. We're still kind of messing between that freezing line, so you may start off with snow, go to rain, and come back to snow in some of these storms. And I say storms because we just went through one. We got another one coming up Tuesday into Wednesday, and then the third one is again more about the cold, but still some precipitation associated with it. So let's talk about it. Now start off with the jet stream coming up on Sunday. Uh, broad, once this first system gets out of here and works to the northeast, Sunday and in into Monday, we'll start to track that next trough. Now this is going to dig farther to the south than the one that we're dealing with this weekend. And what that's going to do is call it a lot of ridging over here towards the east. Uh, so you know, when you see me pull my hair out because you know, we can't really pinpoint who's going to get snow and who's going to get rain, it's because of this. A deep trough back into Texas and Oklahoma is going to push a lot of ridging uh, over here towards the east coast. At the surface, temperatures are going to be warming up and we're going to see temperatures around freezing so easily above freezing and we have to cool all of the air around it before we start talking more about snowfall. I expect that to happen back out here towards the, uh, the parts of the plains and up here to the north where there's already cold air found and it's going to stay as we get into Tuesday and Wednesday. See that first system move off to the northeast rather than to the east and then our next one. You see how far these uh, lines start to sink down to the south and more importantly, they stay day there. So you get a pocket of cold air coming in Friday, Saturday and Sunday, and then a reinforcing shot back over here uh, towards the West Coast, which again isn't going to allow temperatures uh, to warm up or a ridge to develop between these two systems, meaning we're not expecting a big swing in our temperatures. That's the cold air that we've been looking for. Uh, it took until the middle of January for a good portion of the United States. We'll match that up with the precipitation outlook January 9th through the 13th. A lot more green on it during that time period than I've seen probably the last three or four months.
Thanks, Matt. Well, South American weather, the big market mover once again this week to start the new year. But one analyst just returned from a trip to Brazil, what he saw and what it means for the overall production picture. That marketing discussion is next. Well, welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Joe Baklovic, as well as Dan Bossi, joining us. Big topic this week is South America. As we see those weather patterns change, as we see Brazil have increased chances for moisture and a lot of moisture. Dan, you just got back from South America. Before all of these rains, how does that crop look? Well, it's not looking very good, Tyne, especially up in northern Mato Grosso and some of the harvest areas. Uh, we're seeing yields coming in anywhere between 20 and 60 percent below last year. So we at Ag Resource or my office in Ag Resource Brazil have cut the crop estimate to about 150 million metric tons. It's down 13 million metric tons from USDA, but maybe more importantly is that there may be additional cuts coming. And I only say that because the harvest data yield and that drought that persisted from September through December was so disruptive that that soybean crop just not coming along as we would expect. I would point out that Brazil plants a 99 to 104 day soybean down there, doesn't have drought tolerance. It needs good days and it just didn't have many of those, at least over the last few months. Yeah, Joe, I mean, we had Eric Snodgrass on the show just a moment ago and he was talking about how maybe it's too much of a good thing. Too much moisture could delay harvest, delay the safrina crop. But at this point, the market doesn't that doesn't seem to be the sentiment of the market right now. No, this is not overly complicated. We shifted to a wetter pattern in Brazil. That's all there is to it. And that's why the market's down. Now, when you get into the nitty gritty of, is this going to be too much rain? Was the early damage, the early drought, was that too much in some areas? I think that will be sorted out later. But for the moment, the knee jerk reaction, if you're a trader, you're a fund manager, you're looking at the weather maps, that they're as bearish or as wet as they've been throughout this growing cycle. You just don't have an interest in buying soybeans in, in a commodity marketplace that just isn't overly friendly, really, any of the commodity commodity markets right now, with with a couple of exceptions, of course. OK, well, next week, Dan, we do have this next we have USDA report, a question of will we see cuts from USDA and how much right now? What does ag resource companies forecast and how much do you think USDA will adjust this South American crop next week? Well, as I said earlier, we have the crop at 150.2 million metric tons. We believe USDA will adjust down somewhere in the vicinity of 154 to 156. CONAB, the equivalent of the Brazilian USDA, is out on Wednesday. We think they'll be a little more aggressive, maybe 153 to 154 million metric tons. It's down. It's not enough yet to engender that bullish response in the market. But this is where the weather becomes so important as we go through February, March, and, and into the, the, the difficult harvest time frame that is probably still ahead. Yeah, how much of a cut would we need to see then, Joe, to get this market excited? I don't think the USDA report is going to matter a whole lot. The USDA number specifically as it relates to Brazil, they they probably are not going to be as aggressive as maybe they need to be. My opinion is that the market is trading something in the low 150s, 151, 152. So if USDA comes down and into the mid 150s or upper 150s, the market will be aware instantly that USDA is just slow playing the issue. Um, I, I, I think there's an outside chance you end up in the mid to upper 150s, but probably not at this point. Well, the world's biggest buyer of soybeans is changing the way it uses soybeans. What does that mean? We'll talk about it with Joe Vaklovic and Dan Bossy next. Well, welcome back. Just before the break, I mentioned it. World's biggest buyer of soybeans changing the way it uses soybeans. China recently announcing a policy to reduce soybeans and soybean meal and feed rations. That's already having an impact. So, Dan, when you look at this, do you think this is going to significantly change demand in 2024? Well, we will watch it carefully. At this point, we're not seeing it in the data. China's importing a record amount of soybeans, at least globally, uh, from this perspective. So they're still active buying from Brazil. I'll watch it carefully. But when you get the Chinese feed data, it's a little bit of an enigma. We don't have any statistical background to really prove or disprove what they're asking for. And this is not the first time China's made this pivot. They did about three years ago. So again, I'm, I, I think it's a story that the market's listening to. Statistically, though, it's going to be very hard to prove. Yeah, usage in feed, that fell more than 10% in the first 11 months of 2023 compared to the same period in 2022. And when you look at feed usage, that will be something that we could possibly see USDA adjust next week, Joe. 
One of the things that I think is a little bit more immediate and, and maybe important to the marketplace is that crush margins in China are negative. The, the processor in China isn't making money. They've got they've got hog problems again. I think that the uh, the policy move, as Dan mentioned, that they did try a couple of years ago. I remember talking about that. Um, I don't think that's the big deal. I don't know if they have the ability to, to move away from soybeans in the way that they say they're gonna. But the crush situation and and also some of the negatives that we've heard about the Chinese economy are all kind of cause for concern. I think that's a, another part of the reason the soybean market has struggled the way that it has. Yeah, Dan, when you look at some of these geopolitical concerns, though, that's also weighing on the markets, um, what are you watching as we head into the new year? Well, the big one that I've got questions about, and it comes from my Ukrainian clients, is the, of course, Red Sea and the Suez Canal. Uh, you know, a lot of that Ukrainian corn heading to Southeast Asia will go through there. And so, as the price of insurance, as the difficulty in, in moving freight through that part of the world uh, increases with the spreading tensions in the Mideast, they are now forced to go around the Horn of Africa. This is raising uh, freight costs by about $20 a ton. And Ukraine was just getting that corridor working, and now they're fighting with this. Joe, let's switch gears here to, to feed users, talk about livestock a little bit. As we look at cattle prices, you know, big debate right now. Have we already seen the highs in the cattle market? And what are we going to see as we head into 2024? What, what do you think? We've got a decent start to the year. There was some cash trade last week during the holiday week that was a little bit better. We got into a situation where these large money managers or fund traders, they, at the end of the year, kind of cleared out most of the length that they, that they had in the cattle market. And now maybe with some better cash trade, maybe with some weather coming in, maybe they've got the green light to go ahead and own cattle again. And it, and it looks like they're doing that at least through the first uh, few days of the year. I think there's still a, a good fundamental story there. It's a multi-year story. It's, it's not over yet. So that was clearly some sort of low we posted late in 2023. I just don't know if that was the low. Dan, you've said it on the show before. You think 2024 is the year of protein. Do or, Are you still in that camp? No, we're still in that camp. I think when you look at the U.S. beef herd, beef cow herd, if you look at the contraction that we're still having, there's no signs of expansion. We still have runway here for a couple of years of higher meat prices. So my mind is still stuck in 2024 being a year of protein with feeder cattle and cattle being the upside leaders. Dan Joe, thank you so much for joining us. We briefly talked about some of those geopolitical issues that we're watching around the globe. We're going to take a deeper dive into that when we look at agriculture around the globe next. What's happening around the globe has such an impact on agriculture here in the U.S. That's why we're introducing a new segment to the show, Agriculture Around the World. A look at the latest headlines to give you a glimpse of what's happening with agriculture around the globe. And to start off this week, as we look at possible events that could shape agriculture in 2024, world events and geopolitical issues are top of mind for ag economists. The latest Ag Economist Monthly Monitor, a survey conducted by Mizzou and Farm Journal of nearly 70 ag economists from across the U.S., asked economists what unexpected news headlines would you not be surprised to read in 2024. On that list, economists said China falling into a big recession, the possibility of record beef imports into the U.S., and the end to the war in Russia and Ukraine that would bump global food grain supplies and cut prices. Well, we talked about that dry weather in Brazil, but after months of battling shipping delays due to low water levels in the Panama Canal, the Canal's authority now has a plan to address the backlogs and delays. The Panama Canal announcing both short and long-term plans as the area faces impacts of drought. According to Bloomberg, one way is to dam the Indio River and drill a tunnel. Now, other short-term fixes include releasing water from a secondary reservoir to allow 24 vessels a day. Longer term, authorities say the main solution is to damming up that river and piping water five miles into the main reservoir. The cost, well, it's estimated $2 billion and could take six years to complete. The Panama Canal is crucial to world trade. It's estimated that the canal handles 46% of containers moving from Northeast Asia to the U.S. East Coast. And more shipping issues around the globe. One of the largest shipping companies in the world is extending its pause on travel through the Red Sea. Maersk, which is headquartered in Denmark, says it will avoid sending ships through the Suez Canal after Yemen-based militants tried to board one of their ships over the weekend. But this isn't the first incident. The U.S. Central Command reports there have been 24 attacks against merchant ships in the southern Red Sea since mid-November. 
North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is calling for a, quote, radical improvement in the country's farm machinery sector. According to North Korean state media, Kim thinks modernizing agriculture can help tackle continued food shortages. Now, Kim made the statements at a farm machine exhibition earlier this week, calling the need to industrialize farming there an urgent requirement. It's part of the country's economic goals for the new year. Kim said stabilizing ag production at a high level was a key priority this year. Well, as South America sees a sudden switch to wetter weather, here in the U.S., several winter storms are on the way. Is it El Nino, and what could it mean for spring? That's our Farm Journal report next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. The El Nino effect is in full force to start 2024, and with the chain of several winter storms forecast to barrel across the country this month, some areas could see not only a wild start to 2024, but a drought buster to start the new year. As the calendar flipped to the new year, Mother Nature unleashed the potential for back-to-back -back blasts of winter weather. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says it's a hallmark of El Nino. There's no question about it. As I always say, you can't blame an individual or a single storm in El Nino, but you start looking at the overall patterns. And there's absolutely no question that when you start seeing a pattern setting up like this, a, a storm pipeline from the Pacific like this, coming across the Southwest and into the Midwest or the East, that is El Nino. Eric Snodgrass is a well-known ag meteorologist. He says El Nino reached its peak at the end of December. It has plateaued, and what that typically means is we tend to have what we call a back half-weighted winter, which means December, usually pretty mild, not a whole lot to talk about. Once we get going into this new year, the gesture is really going to start to become quite a bit more active. And that's exactly what the U.S. has seen with at least three storm systems lined up for the start of the year. Ruby says it's an active storm track, and it starts in the south, eventually with these systems ending up along the east coast. The storm that's coming out late this week, it's going to be a decent storm system, a decent winter storm, but it's going to pale in comparison to the blockbuster storm that we see coming for early next week. Ruby says then early to midweek next week, another significant storm will emerge from the southwest and Four Corners region. It's going to cross the central and southern plains Monday and reach the lower Great Lakes region, somewhere in the vicinity of Lake Ontario, Lake Erie by Wednesday. That system really has the potential to create a, a wide degree of disarray across the country. The storm will pack a punch with high winds, but it will also bring much needed drought relief. Some of those are going to be big snowmakers through parts of the Midwest. Some of them are going to be putting down some heavy rains across the South. And the big picture here is that our U.S. drought monitor, which still shows about 50 to 55 percent of the land area in some form of drought, about a third of it in the drought categories, okay, that could really change a lot in the coming weeks. That relief could be good news for winter wheat country. We've already chipped away at the drought across the Great Plains. If you looked at the USDA NAS winter wheat conditions, we saw improvement from the end of November to the end of December. Kansas winter wheat jumped from 32% good to excellent at the end of November to 43%. Oklahoma saw a big jump from 53 to 67% good to excellent. So more moisture, more snow, that'll be good news for winter wheat. But talking about the good with the bad, the storm does pose problems for livestock producers. As this storm crosses the Southern Great Plains and moves into the Midwest, we're going to have a big wind-driven snow event, so certainly some livestock stress. And then for the southeast, those folks where it's not a drought situation, they could be dealing with flooding and flash flooding, as well as our first significant severe weather outbreak of the season early next week. As the south braces for impacts of the forecasted storms, Snodgrass says that moisture is desperately needed. The south has been, in my opinion, on the wildest ride with moisture in the last 24 months compared to any other place, in my opinion, on the planet at this point. And as this El Nino pattern takes hold, Snodgrass thinks cotton country could finally see some relief this winter. I think the best chance for recovery of moisture is going to be across the south, pockets of the mid-south, the southeast, and the east coast. That track, you know, from Texas, this is called Texas, to South Carolina, to Maine, I like it. That area is going to be getting some good moisture. Snodgrass says the question is how long until El Nino fades and the impact it will have on spring. If El Nino peaks right now and begins to fade throughout the rest of winter and into spring, most times when that happens, I've looked at every event since 1960, 
Most times when that happens, we tend to do okay in the Midwest the following year in terms of precipitation. Now, that's not a guarantee, but you look at it historically, we tend to get a lot of ridge riding storms, which are often the types of storms that save crops. But that scenario also spells trouble for key growing areas of the south this spring and into summer. The only way you can get a ridge riding storm system is, though, to put heat and drought across the south. That's the cotton belt that could be impacted negatively by that. That's all speculative, but that's all you got this time of year is to base it off of those bigger picture things. With the active storms to start the year, there are still pockets of the country that need much more moisture to replenish dry soils before spring. I'm worried about the northern plains. I'm worried about the Canadian prairie on drought. I'm worried about the lack of snowfall we've had so far in parts of the upper Midwest. We need to be piling a whole lot more snow there. And while last winter was good for moisture in the west, that water has shut off since. The west is still feeding off of last year's drought relief. But it's been actually pretty dry at times in parts of California. The Sierra Nevadas have not picked up their big mountain snows yet. The Northern Cascades and the, and the Rockies still need quite a bit more. Most of the whole Western Basin is sitting between 25 and 50% of normal snowpack here to begin a new year. The debate of just how long El Nino will last is heating up, with talk of La Nina even making a return. But for now, Snodgrass says a strong shot of winter weather isn't a bad thing. But I'll just tell you this, the nastiest winters we've ever had have almost always given us fantastic springs and summers. So I hate to say it, but I'm wishing for just a terrible second half of winter so that I can talk to you next spring and summer going, hey, wasn't that terrible? But now look what we got out of it. Eric Snodgrass is one of several great speakers lined up for Top Producer Summit this year. That conference happens right here in Kansas City, February 5th through the 7th at the Lowe's Hotel. From challenging the norms to an in-depth look at the farm economy from the eyes of the Kansas City Fed, it's a great lineup this year. To register, visit the QR code on your screen. All right, up next, a new segment on the show full of good stuff. That's next. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Tendovo Soybean Herbicide. Raising the pre-emergence bar one clean row at a time. Welcome back. Well, a new segment to U.S. Farm Report that we're adding. It's called Chip's Corner, a familiar face to this show. Chip Flory, host of AgriTalk. But Chip, for our viewers, let's reintroduce you. I mean, yeah. you are more than, than markets. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, 25 years as the editor of Pro Farmer Newsletter uh, put me in a position to better understand a lot of the policy workings and uh, just exactly what the events of every day, uh, how, how it can affect the markets and, and affect the business decisions that farmers need to make every day. Exactly. And as we talked about, uh, you know, last weekend, John Phipps announced he's mm -hmm. retiring a Definitely a, a sad moment on the show. Yep. But you and I talked about it. You can't replace. He brought he brought no. such perspective. You can't replace John Phipps. No, no, absolutely not. That's that's not how I'm built. John is a unique, unique individual in his ability to create those commentaries and and to make them so relatable. Uh, that's that's not me. I I think I'm going to be. I, I I will be better off trying to take the events of the week and apply them to what is happening on your everyday business. That's what we're going to look at in Chip's Corner on, on U.S. Farm. Exactly. So speaking of that, you interview yeah. dozens of folks and talk to dozens of folks for both AgriTalk AM and PM every yeah. week. So you are gathering different perspectives. But you had an interesting conversation as we head into 2024, debate about the Farm Bill, debate about what we will see done in Washington this year. You, you recently had an interesting conversation on the farm bill, though. Yeah, with Senator Roger Marshall from Kansas. And it kind of started with the whole dysfunction of what's happening in Washington, D.C., Tyne. And, and I think most Americans are completely fed up with uh, the dysfunction that is happening. But in that dysfunction, there are some that see opportunities. And I think, I think in this case, Senator Marshall might be one of those that sees some opportunity. The farm bill, it appears that the timeline on the farm bill keeps getting pushed further and further back. I did have an opportunity to ask Senator Marshall if he thinks we'll even get a farm bill in 2024. I don't think so. I think we end up with another extension, and I think we'll have a better farm bill. We'll put the farm back in farm bill if we have a Republican Senate. Pat Roberts always gotcha. got it done. I think we're going to need yep. Republican leadership in the Senate. 
All right, Chip, that's what Senator Marshall had to yeah. say. I mean, yeah. does he think that's going to be a good thing? Do, could we end up with a better bill? Well, he seems to think if we have a Republican-controlled Senate that we will get a better farm bill. My question to the senator should have been in follow-up after thinking about it. The good questions always come up after the fact, by the way. Uh, it should have been, but what about if the House is controlled by the Democrats? Will it be a better bill then? Because there are odds that are leaning that way that uh, following the 24 elections, the Democrats could have control of the House. Well, I'm sure this is a topic we will continue to talk about yes. in 2024. Chip, we're just so glad to add you to the lineup to U.S. Farm. Oh, thank you for asking, Time. Yeah, and we're excited to have you every yeah. week. So again, Chip Flory, host of Agritalk. You can listen to Agritalk live uh, on local affiliates, or you can go to agritalk.com, Chip, right? And that yeah. website has a host of different ways to listen to the show. Absolutely. Agritalk.com is an archive of all of our old shows, all of our old shows. And of course, you can listen to it live as well. All right. Chip Flory for Chip's Corner. Thank you so much. All right. Well, up next, the world's largest collection of hats. You have to see it to believe it. That's American Countryside with Andrew McRae next. I imagine many of you watching have a hat collection. I mean, it's a common complaint I hear at farm shows across the country. You'll take a hat, but it's not like you need one with so many piled up at home. But leave it to Andrew McRae. He stumbled on the world's largest hat collection as we travel the countryside this weekend. And when my dad loading the semi, this In the 1960s, dad. Scott Legrid's dad was farming as well as selling livestock equipment and snowmobiles. He was on the road and would occasionally be given a hat by those with whom he did business. What I had heard is he went into the closet to get something one day and there was a bunch of hats on a shelf that was kind of different colors. And he said, that's kind of pretty. It'd be kind of fun just to collect some of them. Scott's father began collecting hats, sorting and boxing them. As Scott grew, he and his father were always working on their family farm that dates to 1875. Many of the hats had ties to their livelihood. A lot of it was farm hats. That's just because we're in that industry and our family's been doing it for so long. Um, he had, there again, he had another couple rules. They had to have a patch on them or an advertisement. They couldn't be plain. And then they couldn't have any dirty sayings. They had to be clean sayings. Over time, the collection grew, and his father set personal goals for the number and types of hats he wanted to collect. So these are a lot of the John Deere hats. One of those achievements was tied to John Deere dealerships. He wanted to get a John Deere hat that said the state and the name of the dealership, implement dealer, from every state, so all 50 states. And once he had all 50 states, he set out to get one from each Canadian province as well. Scott's father passed in 2011, which means Scott oversees thousands of hats today. So this is still the world's largest hat collection. Over 109,000, I would guess about 115,000 if I had to take a guess. And they did not collect duplicate hats, so each should be unique. They got the same logo and colors, but if you look, this one is solid, and this, this one is mesh, so yeah. that makes them different. Yep. Yeah. Scott has some hats displayed in his home, along the walls, and on shelves in the garage. There's three semi-loads of hats that have been boxed, documented, and categorized. They did that when Guinness Book certified the collection several years ago. Scott's father loved collecting hats, yet he says there is something a bit ironic about the collection. He wasn't a big hat wearer. He wore a couple weeks in the spring for planting and then a couple weeks in the fall when we harvested to keep the sun out of his eyes, of course. And that was it. Mostly in the winter, he wore a stocking hat. And other than that, he didn't wear one. So that's kind of funny. But Scott, on the other hand, does wear hats, but he doesn't pick from the collection. It's kind of sacred. I'll just stare at him for just a few minutes to remind myself of some of the companies that used to be around that aren't around anymore because there's quite a few companies here that aren't around anymore, sad to say, just how times go. Scott enjoys these hats, but he does hope they can find a permanent home someday where more people can see them, all of them, and the story they share about farming and more through what's emblazoned on the hats. My dad was my best friend, and I'm proud for what he reached for his goals and kind of fun to reminisce about it. It reminds me of my dad. When I'm on the farm, I wear a hat every day. But to show you the size of Scott's collection, if I were to wear a different hat from this collection every day, it'd take me 319 years to get through the collection. 
Driving the Countryside in Frost, Minnesota. I'm Andrew McCray. As Andrew mentioned, that collector would like to find a permanent home for those hats, whether that be a community or museum that would be dedicated to displaying them. If you have any ideas, email us at mailbag at usfarmreport.com. Well, speaking of museums, we're off to the Lone Star State to see a cotton picker from the 1950s that now has a permanent home indoors. Tractor Tales is next. Hey folks, welcome back to Tractor Tales. This week we are going to head to Texas to check out a 1956 John Deere cotton picker. This was actually mounted on a farm tractor. Yeah, this is a 1956 model cotton picker. Of course, cotton was harvested predominantly by hand up until really didn't transition near 100% until the early 60s of mechanical harvesting. But this was mounted on a G John Deere, happened to be a 52 model. A lot of them were mounted on 420 John Deere, which was more the age of the picker. So this tractor is actually older than the machine. But it was mounted, if you'll notice, running backwards. So the only gear they had for harvesting was a reverse gear. So then it has two seats on it. It's got the regular tractor seat. So if you move it from farm to farm, you get the regular tractor seat and go forward with it. Pretty crude, but advancement in the picker mechanism compared to the day is not a re remarked difference. The way it actually, the mechanism does the picking. An entire museum is just impressive. All right, up next, a dairy farm employee who proves resilience is the key to success. It's a touching story and journey. We have it next. During the recent Milk Business Conference, several new awards were rolled out, including one honoring a top dairy employee who represents excellence in supporting the dairy through their role on the farm. And the winner is one that exemplifies resilience and excellence as his journey is unique. Lorenzo Vitorino came to America as a 15-year-old boy with his family. I came here in uh, 1991, uh, eight kids, five boys, three girls, and, uh, and my dad and my mom, of course, 10 people. He was put straight into high school where he says he faced bullying and then money got tight for his family. That's when he started working on a dairy farm. So I had to go work with one of the, the oldest brother that it's working here for Vance too. And very quickly, he found his calling. They asked me if I wanted to be the herdsman. And of course I was young, but I said yes. And there was a lot of challenges here that we went through and uh, uh, it was a lot of hard work, but we did it. The operation owned by Vance Alum and the Alum family. Lorraine has now worked for the family for 34 years. A few years ago, Vance said, hey, I'm thinking about doing robots. You know, robots, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> if I didn't have his buy-in, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing today and we would not have transitioned as quickly because he put his heart and soul into to this process and, and making every startup better. Lorraine pivoting to learn everything he could about the robots as the operation made the transition to robotic milking, bringing a new system online every two months. When he thinks about startup, he's thinking about how can we be easy on the cows, what's the most comfortable for the cows. But it's not just the cows that benefit from Lorraine's years of experience. It's really the entire crew. Loren is like family to us. Um, he does a tremendous job. He, he treats this facility as if he owns it. Um, a lot of times if I find something out that's going on from the guys at the dairy before he does, <laughs> he's not happy about it because he takes so much pride in that this is his baby to run. And he's, he's just always there for us. I feel like Loreno has kind of the unique ability to have really high standards which could seem daunting to a lot of workers, but he also has the ability to kind of get the respect from the guys, keep things fun, keep people motivated. And I always tell them, hey, you, you learn and maybe someday you have an opportunity. I don't want to lose you, but hey, if you do, because I did it too, for myself, to, for my family, to benefit my family. And I never hold nothing back. If they want to learn, I'm here to help them. Lorraine was presented with the opportunity to start his own dairy a couple years ago, but he said no, happy to stay right where he is. 
He, he's very proud um, of what he does and how he does it. Um, he's, he just wants it done right. And if it, his name's gonna be associated to it, it needs to be done the best it can be. He doesn't do things halfway. And he says he's humbled to be a Milk Business Award winner. Well, that means a lot because this was a team, not only one person. You're not gonna be able to do this one person. Congratulations, Lorraine, this is well-deserved. The team you've put together is tremendous. And Ashley and I, and my mom and dad, Jim and Carol, owe a lot to you. And we really appreciate all this, all that you've done for our family and success of, of County Line and what was James Allen Dairy before. So thank you very much, Lorraine. Congratulations to this year's Milk Business Award winner for employee excellence, Lorraine Vitorino of County Line Farm in Denaire, California. Congratulations, I had the chance to meet him at the Milk Business Conference. What a wonderful individual, much deserved. All right, that does it for U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to tune in again next weekend as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.